History buffs of Reddit. What is a piece of history that often goes overlooked despite being very interesting or funny? There was a word that American soldiers used to call medics over to them if injured. World War II. Over in Japan. The name Talula was chosen due to the L sounds and the name. The Japanese pronunciation of this was noticeable. Not nearly as noticeable as them yelling medic. Which was done by the Japanese soldiers to lure American medics over to kill them. Anyway, I wrote a poem about this history tidbit in college, and I think it will always be one of the least suckiest things I've written. During the First Sino-Japanese War, a Chinese admiral pawned one of the main guns on his flagship to a scrap dealer, in order to pay off some gambling debts. This was the same war where the Empress embezzled from the army to fund her palace renovations. It's amazing they lost that one. The American Hippo Bill during a meat crisis in 1910, some American legislators wanted to introduce African hippos to the southern wetlands so we could all enjoy lake cow bacon. Obviously, the bill never passed. We have a huge rodent problem here in New York City. I suggest we introduce black mambas into the city to eradicate the problem. Attila the Hun had a son named Erp. He also left this son absolutely nothing, dividing his kingdom between three other sons. So he got no inheritance, and a hysterical name. In Bernal Diaz del Castillo's The True History of the Conquest of New Spain he mentions that a priest died during his time with Cortes. When searching through his stuff, they found a leather adult toy. Another funny incident, they held Montezuma hostage in modern day Mexico City. While a hostage, he still had gold and was a king. So he was treated half decently. One of the Spanish guards accidentally farted in his face. The guard was embarrassed and apologized profusely for humiliating a noble. To show there were no hard feelings, Montezuma gave the guard a gold piece. The stupid guard then farted again hoping to get another gold piece. He comes up now and again on Till. But for all the history about World War II that is often banded about in the culture at large I had never heard about the fascinating double agent Juan Pugil Garcia, also known by his codename, Garbo. The story, Juan was from Spain and had become disgusted by fascism. He wrote letters to the UK and the US saying hey, I'll spy on Germany for you guys UK and US said nah, we got this. Juan said to himself I'll go ahead and spy anyway and posed as a Nazi loving Spanish govt official to become a German agent. He was assigned to spy on London, but instead went to Lisbon and made up phony reports based on English magazines and newsreels. After a while, the UK realized someone was doing a jolly good job diverting Nazi resources and took him on as a spy. He worked throughout the war, with Germany funding his totally real network of not at all imaginary spies. He was responsible for diverting many German troops during the invasion of Normandy. He was also awarded medals by both the Nazis and the Brits for his work. That time Liechtenstein sent 80 soldiers to war and they made a friend so they returned with 81. I love how simple and hilarious this is. I will preface this by saying our sources from the time are sketchy at best, so this may not have happened, but I digress. We all know Charlemagne yes? King of the Franks and all that. Well, while he did a great deal for the Frankish legacy, he wasn't the first independent Frankish king. That honor went to a guy named Childeric, and this dude must have been fine as frick because his sexual escapades are insane. So Childeric was actually king twice, but he never got usurped, nope. He was instead exiled, not for killing anyone or crap like that, just because he fricked so many of the Frankish nobles' wives. Genuinely, the sources tell us he was banished because all the lords realized that their wives were all cheating on them with the same dude, and so told the king to frick off, so he duly did, and ended up in the court of another barbarian king as an ally to him. During this time, he got into the royal court, got chatting with the king's wife, and you guessed it, diddled the lass. Following this, rather than keeping it a thing on the down low, Childeric straight up declared that he was marrying the wife, ran off with her, and brought her back to the nobles that thought they were finally rid of the horny bastard. Fortunately for women everywhere, this queen seems to have had a bit of metal, because nothing else is written about him running off with any other important women. Instead he had a son, a lad named Clovis, and thus began the rise of the Frankish Empire that spawned modern day Germany and France. So two modern European nations have a grandfather who was just a massive horny freak. Childeric takes the seduction focus, abdicates due to faction demand, 
goes to an ally's court, seduces the ally's wife, the ally divorces his wife, Childeric marries the wife, he presses his claim, becomes king again, and has a son with God. Tier stats. When Cortes conquered the Aztecs he had 10 feet 000s of native allies who were more than eager to help because the Aztecs used them as slave and sacrifice farms. Robert Liston, for whom Listerine is named if memory serves, is the only person in history to have performed a surgery with a 300% mortality rate, meaning that 3 people died from one operation. The patient died of gangrene, Liston cut the fingers of his assistant who also died from gangrene, and he literally scared an onlooker to death by cutting his coattails. This was back when anesthetics were non-existent and speed made a bigger difference. The Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire or whatever you would call it, all of it, all the stumbles, all the resurgences, not to mention all the meaningless disasters. Any nation surviving for 1000 years from the Dark Ages to the start of the Renaissance has served well in its time, all things considered. Mark Twain and his buddies decided to join the Confederate Army, it was an excuse to get away from the wives, hang out in the woods, and drink. This went on for a couple of weeks until word came that the Union Army was advancing. Shortly thereafter, all the men quit their made-up unit and headed home. During World War II, there were sightings up and down the eastern coast of U-boats. Hemingway heard there was one off of Key West and decided he should hunt it down. He and a couple buddies loaded up a boat with booze, guns, and grenades. They were unsuccessful, and returned home shortly after the booze ran out. The Aztecs are overlooked in most history classes, but they were far from the primitive tribesmen that most people think of. At the height of its power Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Triple Alliance, was rivaled in size by cities like London and Constantinople, and it was all built on a giant artificial island. It's a shame their culture was obliterated, because though they might have been a bit too obsessed with sacrificial killing, they were an incredibly fascinating civilization. On top of this they were defeated by Cortes and his handful of European soldiers, as well as almost 100,000 other natives that were enemies of the Aztecs. People tend to leave that part out. It could easily be argued that if they weren't so obsessed with sacrificing and fighting their neighbors they would never have been beaten. Romans believed in other people's gods goddess, so when they would attack a city they would pray to the god gods of said city to abandon the occupants and support the Romans instead. If they won they would give the god a special place in Rome or completely incorporate it into the state religion. Also the ancient Greeks did not view it as gay or straight they saw it as dominant and submissive. In short they had no concept of being gay. Cato the Elder, a Roman senator, would give several vehement speeches, all ending in something along the lines of Carthago de Lender estate, roughly translating to Carthage must be destroyed. Carthage did end up getting destroyed a couple years after he died. Years later, Cato the Younger was on the Senate. Julius Caesar was reading a note during a meeting, causing Cato to accuse him of being a spy. After Caesar denied the accusations, Cato asked Caesar to read out the note, because if he really was innocent, he wouldn't have anything to hide. Caesar agreed. It was a love note from Cato the younger sister. Furthermore, I think Carthage should be destroyed. That thing with Cato the younger and the note happened with Julius Caesar, not Augustus. Jack Churchill, as per Wikipedia, Lieutenant Colonel John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Jack Churchill, DSO and Bar, MC and Bar, the 16th of September 1906 the 8th of March 1996, was a British army officer who fought throughout the Second World War armed with a longbow, bagpipes, and a basket, hilted Scottish broadsword, nicknamed Fighting Jack Churchill and Mad Jack, he is known for the motto, any officer who goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed, it is claimed that Churchill also carried out the last recorded longbow and arrow killing in action shooting a German co in 1940 in a French village during the Battle of France. When all your troops are upgraded except that one guy who's lived for two centuries. The Victorians were not prudes. That factoid about having the legs of furniture covered? Yeah, that was a joke Brits made about Americans perceived prudery. Then again, the Brits were pretty goddamn kinky. Spanking was known as the English vice because it was offered in so many brothels and had lots of erotic novels written about it. 
prostitution was one of the only ways women could support themselves without hard labor. Of course, plenty of men and women realized they could make a fortune as pimps or madams, so sex slavery, or white slavery, was a big problem. The thing that fascinates me about this period is that it looks all chaste at first glance, but sexuality was really a driving force in so many aspects of society, and once you're familiar with the attitudes and euphemisms of the time, you can see that sex was everywhere. The trick was to drape it in pretty words and crimson blushes. World War II Ghost Army Regiment, allied force who recruited from art schools and theater, used deception tricks such as inflatable tanks to deflect attention and deceive the enemy, both insane and genius at the same time. I'm going to say European kings named Charles. The Charleses in France had an unfortunate tendency to be labeled with less than complimentary epithets, Charles the Fat, Charles the Bald, and Charles the Mad. That always tickled me. Also King Charles II of England was a badass. Ever been to a pub called the Royal Oak? That is named after the tree Charles climbed to escape the roundheads when he was fleeing the Civil War. Top quotes. I always admired virtue but could never imitate it. In response to his brother's concerns about assassination attempts on Charles II, I am sure no man in England will take away my life to make you king. When Parliament questioned his aptitude for kingship in Parliament, I'm definitely the best king in England at the moment. The Sea Peoples. I am totally fascinated by them. I am currently reading 1177 BC the year civilization collapsed by E.H. Klein. It focuses on Egypt, who really was the only civilization to withstand the sea people. I thoroughly enjoyed hearing how kamikaze pilots would crash into things to terrorize and damage them. However, this wasn't as effective as they thought. Unfortunately and hilariously, the ironic problem was that nobody was able to go back and report that it wasn't working that great. Near the end of the war, the kamikaze planes were basically balsa frames with the nose full of explosives. I read a book entitled Divine Wind many years ago. That fact stuck with me. It's amazing to me they actually managed to get the planes to any location to do any damage. That more than one war has been started because of people throwing other people through a window in Prague. President Andrew Jackson beat up his would-be assassin with his cane and had to be pulled off by Davy Crockett so he wouldn't kill the guy. If you read through the wikipage of serial killer Albert Fish it's really messed up the crimes he committed but one pretty random hilarious thing stands out. He began to have auditory hallucinations. He once wrapped himself in a carpet, saying that he was following the instructions of John the Apostle. I like under the trial and execution part they said. None of the jurors doubted that Fish was insane, but ultimately, as one later explained, they felt he should be executed anyway. Savage. During the Second Punic War, Hannibal, the Carthaginian general, repeatedly outsmarted and decisively beat the Romans, to the point that many Romans honestly thought the end was near. It wasn't until Scipio Africanus was made general that the war turned in their favor and they won. The interesting part, some time after the war, Scipio visited the court of the king of Syria and met Hannibal there, and the two of them had a conversation. Scipio asked Hannibal who he thought were the three greatest generals of all time. Hannibal replied that Alexander was the greatest, Pyrrhus was the second best, a slight jab at Scipio since Pyrrhus fought Rome in the Pyrrhic War, and Hannibal himself was the third best. Scipio thought this was an arrogant answer, since Hannibal had been beaten by Scipio but still thought himself a better general than Scipio. Scipio asked how high on the list Hannibal would be if he had managed to win the war. Hannibal replied that in that case, he would be even greater than Alexander. I like to think of it as a sort of indirect compliment. Sort of sweet almost. The Battle of Bowmanville. My grandfather was a prison guard at the German prisoner of war camp in Bowmanville, Ontario. Canada. He told me stories of the riots that took place there. According to him and documents about the place, the higher-ups were ordered to shackle 100 prisoners in retaliation for something the Nazi party did. None of the prisoners volunteered so they made the officers that were captured pick. When they refused the guards went to take 100 prisoners and shackle them. Many of the German pals in the camp resisted and barricaded themselves in the large hall blocking the doors with seats. They prepared for the worst as they had heard of Americans killing prisoners without hesitation and waited for the gunfire to start. The Canadians gathered 100 men, 
armed with baseball bats and hockey sticks and stormed the building. They only used basic weapons so it would be a fair fight. The fighting continued for 4 hours straight, or according to my grandpa, we gave those jerriers a good crap kicking that day. 4 hours of boot to ass, but the suckers never gave up, so we covered each other and backed out, locked them in the building and grabbed the fire hoses. The fricks didn't know what hit them when we broke 4 windows and turned the hoses on full blast, so we washed the suckers out of the building. The pals gave up when the building started to flood and surrendered, as they were marched out of the hall. The Canadian guards who fought them stood in line beside the door and shook their hands, congratulating them on a good fight. There were many more riots around the camp, like 2,500 people total rioted but most were very quickly captured. This was the main and defining battle of the uprising. Many people were seriously injured and one of the leaders of the riot was shot in the back. I don't think anyone was killed by I could be wrong. It was probably the most Canadian battle of the whole war. They didn't want to outnumber them in the fight and wouldn't go in with guns cause that was unfair. The most serious injury in the battle for the Canadians according to my grandpa was when one of his friends took a jar of honey to the head and it cut up the guy's face pretty bad. With a skull fracture. Otherwise business as usual at the camp. That's the only thing I ever remember my grandpa bragging about besides his butcher shop in the barn for the food he would hunt. If you ever get in a fight, just grab something. Six people I took out on my own with a broken hockey stick and a chair leg. That was the day we made a mess of the mess hall. My grandpa. The Greek stoic philosopher Chrysippus died of laughter after watching a drunk donkey trying to eat a fig. Julius Caesar was captured near the island farm Acusa by pirates who already at that time controlled the sea with large armaments and countless small vessels to begin with. Then, when the pirates demanded 20 talents for his ransom, he laughed at them for not knowing who their captive was, and of his own accord agreed to give them 50. In the next place, after he had sent various followers to various cities to procure the money and was left with one friend and two attendants among Cilicians, most murderous of men, he held them in such disdain that whenever he lay down to sleep he would send and order them to stop talking. For 8 and 30 days, as if the men were not his watchers, but his royal bodyguard, he shared in their sports and exercises with great unconcern. He also wrote poems and sundry speeches which he read aloud to them, and those who did not admire these he would call to their faces illiterate barbarians, and often laughingly threaten to hang them all. The pirates were delighted at this, and attributed his boldness of speech to a certain simplicity and boyish mirth. But after his ransom had come from Miletus and he had paid it and was set free, he immediately manned vessels and put to sea from the harbor of Miletus against the robbers. He caught them, too, still lying at anchor off the island, and got most of them into his power. Their money he made his booty, but the men themselves he lodged in the prison at Pergamum, and then went in person to Junius, the governor of Asia, on the ground that it belonged to him, as praetor of the province, to punish the captives. But since the praetor cast longing eyes on their money, which was no small sum, and kept saying that he would consider the case of the captives at his leisure, Caesar left him to his own devices, went to Pergamum, took the robbers out of prison, and crucified them all, just as he had often warned them on the island that he would do, when they thought he was joking. Plutarch, the life of Julius Caesar. Hundreds of US communities started using their own currencies during the Great Depression in order to bypass economic downfall. Of course there was the Dust Bowl and other factors at play, but it generally worked. Sometimes, it's as simple as stepping outside the systems that are in place. Some of our problems really only exist on paper. You have been visited by the science doggo upvote now and you will get high grades and good results within the next week. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check out another video. Or don't. Either way, have a great day you magnificent people.